Praise the Lord. God is good. He is gracious and he is faithful. Amen. What a wonderful morning it is. Uh, six months. Wow. I, I, you know, it's flown by for me. I don't know about you, but it has flown by and it has been such a joy uh, for those of you who trickled in perhaps a little afterward uh, after we started. My name is Mark Anthony and together with my wife Erica for the last six months and with God's help for the foreseen future, we have the joy of being pastors here at Van Ness and it is such a joy and an honor to serve the Lord and to serve you all. We are grateful. We are honored. Amen. And this morning, we're going to continue, uh, we're actually going to conclude a series um, today. Next week, I'm, I'm starting a, a two-part series um, that we are going to be sharing. One of the things that, if I may, just take a moment, that I, uh, Erica and I really feel impressed upon our heart as we've been here and as we've been praying. Uh, we, we believe that we're going to see growth in the church. How many say amen? But one of the things that, amen. One of the things that Erica and I feel such a burden for and so strongly that part of that growth is going to be people who are returning to Christ. And, and I believe that we are going to enter into a season as a church where prodigal sons and daughters are going to come home. That prodigal sons and daughters are going to come home. So starting next week, um, I'm going to do a two-part series. It's a very known passage of scripture. I'm going to speak on the parable of the two sons. Uh, and I'm going to speak about the prodigal son, and I'm going to speak about the, uh, the first week, and I'm going to speak about the older brother the following week. And so uh, it's a very familiar parable, but I believe that God has something new and fresh for us in this season as a church because I believe we're going to see sons and daughters return home. And so I want, I, I want to share that burden, share that heart, but that we would align ourselves with the heart of God for his lost children, for his lost sons and daughters, and, and that we would prepare ourselves to receive them as the father did in that parable. So next two weeks, be prepared. That's what we're going to be sharing about. But today we are concluding this series on sincerely held beliefs. Uh, we started this three weeks ago addressing um, just positions that we have taken as a church, not just as Van Ness, but as an Assemblies of God church. The Assemblies of God adopted these positions a couple of years ago and have encouraged all Assemblies of God churches to incorporate these in their governing documents. And so we did. And, and, and in doing so, I don't want it to just be something that is in our Constitution and bylaws. I want this to be something that we engage with, that we think about, that we process, that we understand and have clarity on. So three weeks ago, we started addressing the issue of identity, sexual agen identity, gender dysphoria, all these different things that are in, in permeating society today. The week thereafter, we addressed godly marriage. We talked about how, yes, God created the male and female. Our identity is in the one who made us. The call is to holiness. And then we looked at godly marriage. We can get up in arms about the legalization of same-sex unions and things like that and say, well, marriage is under attack. Our response is to strive for a godly marriage. And if we as the church can honor godly marriage and if we can work towards godly marriage, I believe the church can be the catalyst for that societal change that we so desperately need. Last week, we looked at the issue of the sanctity of human life and what is our charge as a church to those who have perhaps had an abortion. Yes, we stand firm on the right to life and we pray and we speak up for those who do not have voice, but those who do not have voice are not limited to little ones that are being formed in their mother's womb. And so there's a call to us to stand for that right and stand for that and work towards that. And today, I'm going to address an issue that is old as time. I'm going to talk about communal harmony because I believe that that is the goal that we have. I believe that is the standard that scripture says in the Psalms, how beautiful it is when brothers and sisters can live together in unity. Other translations say how beautiful it is. This is Psalm 133, when brothers and sisters can live together in harmony. And today what I'm going to talk about is the unfortunate reality that we experience in society because of the brokenness of society, because of the sinful nature of man. I'm going to address racial inequality. I'm going to address racism. We're going to talk about the root of these things, and we're going to talk about what is our challenge as a church as we work to address these matters. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you grace me now, Holy Spirit? May the words that come out of my mouth be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Lord, would you use your word to challenge us today, to encourage us, 
to give us insight and understanding. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm not Caucasian. I don't know if that, like, you know, was something that you realized. Um, and so this is a, a, a topic that uh, is, is something that I'm not talking about theoretically. When I talk about racism, I'm talking about things that I have lived. Uh, but I will also say, I want to also diffuse the idea that only people who are Caucasian, only people who are Anglo, only people who are described as white, uh, only they can be racist. That, that's an idea that exists in society, and I want to tell you that that's a lie from the pit of hell. It's not true. I, it's not true. And the idea is, well, people of uh, ethnic background, people of color, well, they're not in positions of power. They're not a majority. Therefore, they cannot be racist. And I want to tell you that it's not true. I, I, I want to tell you that because of unfortunate life experiences, things that people have endured over the years, there has been a, a seed of hatred that has burrowed in the hearts of people who, yes, have been oppressed, who, yes, have been mistreated, who, yes, have been taken advantage of. And yet the reality of it is, is that they have arrived at preconceived notions of people because of the color of their skin the same way that they have. What I'm saying is that there are people in the brown and black community, there are people of ethnic background who think all white people are the same. All white people are racist. All white people are this. All white people are that, whatever the case may be. And can I tell you that when we adopt that kind of language as believers, oh, it is dangerous. Not only is it dangerous, it does not please the heart of God. And we need to make sure that we mark the difference in our speech and in our conduct. And when it comes to matters of race, when it comes to matters of, of bigotry, when it comes to matters of prejudice, when it comes to these matters that we see in society since the beginning of time, yes, we live it. Yes, there are those of us who have been on different sides of the conversation. But we have to realize that we count it all loss for the sake of following Christ. I am proud of my heritage. You've heard me say I'm proud to be Puerto Rican. I'm proud to be Cuban. I'm proud to be from East Harlem. I'm proud to be from New York. But I count it all lost for the sake of following Jesus Christ. If the Lord can use my ethnic background for the sake of me ministering to somebody, praise the Lord. Uh, in a couple of weeks, my wife and I, as we have for the last several years, we'll be taking our family mission trip. We'll be going to Cuba. One of the reasons why I can do that is because I am an American-born son to a Cuban immigrant. I'm grateful for my heritage. My heritage has opened a fruitful door for ministry. I am a dual citizen. I am able to do things in Cuba that perhaps others cannot. Why? Because of the family in which I was born into. But outside of that, I count it all lost. Why? Because in Christ Jesus, I have a new identity. But we live in a day and age in which while that might be our reality, there are still those who may make judgments about us because of the color of our skin, because of our accent, because of what they think they know about us, or because of what our countenance or our features or our physical body represents and what they think they have an understanding. And I know it all too well because, as I said, I've been on the receiving end of racist comments, of racist remarks. Um, I, even living in Spain for three and a half years, I oftentimes got confused for Moroccan. And there are, quite frankly, there are still tensions today with between Spain and Morocco. And I remember one time having to travel for ministry. We were going to the island, we were not the island, but we were going to the um, city of Ceuta, which is on the continent of Africa, and it borders Morocco. And my father was like, make sure you take your passport. And I was like, I don't need to take my passport. It belongs to Spain. I'm a Spanish resident. I have my Spanish ID card. He was like, yeah, but listen to me. Just take your passport. You lose nothing in taking it. Can I tell you, I was glad I listened to my dad. Because when I get to Ceuta and we're there and we're trying to leave, they did not want to let me back on the boat. They didn't want to let me back on the boat. They didn't want to let me back on the ferry to take the one hour ride across the Mediterranean to go back to Spain because they thought I was a Moroccan that was trying to illegally immigrate. And so I'm talking with the officer and he's getting all hot and heavy and he's getting upset at me and I show him my US passport and then he was confused. <laughs> he was confused. And then my wife, God bless her, wise woman as she is, she was like, stop talking to him in Spanish, talk to him in English. 
And so I was like, I'm an American. And then he was even more confused. <laughs> you looking the way you do, you're an American? He's like, you're not going to fool me with that accent that you picked up from Netflix. <laughs> I was like, I'm an American. Thank God there was a man from Interpol who came over. He was like, what's going on? What's the matter? So I'm talking to him in English. I was like, this guy doesn't believe that my papers are real. He doesn't believe that I'm an American. He was like, this guy is clearly an American. What's your problem? Thankfully, they let me on the boat, and I was able to go back, and I called my father, and I was like, Dad, you were right. I say that to say because I know what it is to be on the receiving end of someone's preconceived notions. <coughs> if I did Ancestry.com, maybe I got Moroccan somewhere down the line. But because of what I look like, because of what he saw, he had an idea. And I was treated with anything but respect. I was treated with anything but kindness. I was treated with anything but consideration. So when I talk about these matters, I, I am not speaking as one who's read a book. Although I have read books and articles on the topic. I'm speaking as somebody who's lived it. But the reality of this, the root of racism, the root of prejudice, the root of bigotry in society, it's simple. It's pride. It's when we don't do what Romans calls us to. It's when we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. When we think that because where we're from or where we were born or because of the color of our skin, we're better than somebody else. And, and let me tell you, let me let you in on a secret in case you are of a fairer complexion. It even happens amongst people of color. It even happens amongst people of color. Well, you have a darker complexion. I have a lighter complexion. And we try to even bring those thoughts and divisions even amongst ourselves. But can I tell you that if we don't realize the scheme of Satan, if we don't realize the scheme of the enemy to devalue God's creation, because at the root of it, it is that it is devaluing God's creation. Because together we are the tapestry of his workmanship. We are the tapestry of his workmanship. And we can get caught up in, you know, all these things. I, I laugh when people be like, the black community. I'm like, what do you mean by the black community? Because I got family who are not African American, but they black. <laughs> you know, I know black people from Honduras. I know black people from Cuba. I know black people from DR. What do you, when you say black, what exactly is it that you mean? When you say white, what is it exactly that you mean? My mother's Puerto Rican, born on the island, and she's as white as porcelain. She is. And so it's like, well, what exactly is it that you mean? And the reality of it is, is that when we make these generalizations, when we make these statements, what we do is we devalue people, and then we miss the opportunity to get to know them and get to know their story. And we as a church have to do better, and we as a church have to do different. We can't get caught up in the conversations the way that other people have. We have to disregard our preconceived notions about a person because of what we think they represent. And the example, the best example that we find in scripture, there's a lot. I've talked about, you know, when we, when we addressed our core values and we addressed different things, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Jesus summarized the whole of the law and love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And then, of course, the retort was, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus preaches about the Samaritan. Right? And, and we've talked about that. And there are so many different nuances all throughout scripture. When we talked about the baptism of Cornelius, the racial nuances that are there that we could easily overlook about how Peter said, now I understand that God is impartial. Peter had his own preconceived notions about Rome and about the Romans. There are so many different things. But the answer to the church of how we are to engage with this matter, I believe, is best found in the book of Philemon. And I'm going to paraphrase today because the book of Philemon, while it is short, I'm not going to read its entirety. I am going to highlight a couple of verses. But the book of Philemon is essentially this. It is an appendix, if you will. It is, a, it is in conjunction with the book of Colossians. So Paul writes this letter to the church in Colossae, and he is addressing this baby church that he planted during his mission trips, and then he is writing a letter back to them from prison. It is an epistle, same as he had written letters to other churches, other places as well. But in addition to the letter of Colossians, he writes this 
very short letter to a leader in that church by the name of Philemon. And he addresses him, and he says, Philemon and Aphia, in the church in your house, right? He's addressing Philemon. He's addressing Philemon's wife. He's addressing their son. He's addressing their work in the ministry. But then he is writing on a very, very personal matter. He's addressing a young man that he has now come to receive as a spiritual son. In his missionary journey and in his work, he comes across this young man by the name of Onesimus. And as he gets to know Onesimus and hear Onesimus' story, what he finds out is that Onesimus is a runaway slave. He's a runaway slave. He was an individual that was property of another person. And he loves on this young man, leads this man to Jesus, and comes to receive him as a son. And then he challenges Onesimus to do something very challenging. Be the message courier to take this letter back. Be the one who's going to take this letter to the church in Colossae. And along with it, take this letter to my brother, Philemon, who's leader of this church. Think about that. Th think about that in, in perhaps our context. Think about things that you've seen over the years or stories that you've heard from your own family. Think about the fact that Onesimus is a runaway slave who has now found freedom, but what Paul teaches him is, you think you're free, but true freedom is only found in Christ. And because now you have freedom in Christ, go back to your old slave owner. Think about that. The weight of that. And whatever way you identify in the cultural spectrum, realize what Paul was challenging Onesimus to do. And Onesimus does. He takes the letter back to Philemon. And he addresses Philemon in this letter, and he's talking to him. And then he says some things that are so beautiful, so powerful, that we need to wrestle with today. And it's found in verse 17 that I really want to start. In this letter, as he's talking about this partner in ministry, he says, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would me. He goes on to say, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. He is sending back a young man who was a slave, and he's writing to the slave owner, and he says, this young man who you once saw as property, receive him as you would me. Now, who is Paul? Paul was a spiritual father to that church. He was the one who planted that church. He was a man who was worthy of honor in their eyes. He was a man who was a Roman citizen. He was a man who was of the once upon a time upper crust of the Jewish society. And he says, when he comes, receive him as you would me. Can I tell you, this is one of the first challenges to us as a church. When we have those friends who may have preconceived notions, when we have those family members that might have biases or bigotry or whatever the case is, when we are willing to stand in the gap and say, treat them as you would treat me. Receive them as you would receive me. When they make flippant remarks that are disparaging, when they make flippant remarks that are erroneous, when they make remarks and comments that are hurtful, you interject and you say, you don't talk to me that way. You don't talk about me in that fashion. Receive them as you would me. And then they could say, well, no, but you're different. And the question is, well, how do you know? Because I know you. Exactly. Do you know them? Have you made the effort to get to know these people? Have you made the effort to have conversations? Have you made the effort to ask questions and understand their culture, to understand their life experience? Have you made the effort to build relationship? Or are you just simply dismissing because of what you think you know? Receive him as you would me. 
So wherever you are in the cultural tapestry that we have in this beautiful church, wherever you are in your ethnic background or your culture or your heritage, when we are willing to stand in the gap and speak up and say, receive them as you would me, it shifts the conversation. It shifts the dynamic. It challenges people to go beyond their preconceived notions, to go beyond their biases, beyond their prejudices, and realize, well, the love that I have for you, perhaps I could have that love for this person that I've disregarded, I've left them. Receive him as you would me. If you consider me a partner, think about this. We talked about this Friday night, and he was writing to a church that was in the trenches with him. He was writing to a people that had gone through perhaps some persecution as they were getting this fledgling church up off the ground. And they went through these things together. And so he says, if you consider me a partner. So again, he is hinging this ask on an existing relationship. If you consider me a partner, receive him as you would me. He goes on to say, and if he has wronged you at all, if he has owes you anything at all, charge that to my account. Charge that to my account. Think about the beauty of this statement. If he's done anything that you don't like, if he's done anything that has hurt you, if he's done anything, charge that to my account. And then I've, I've left it out, but you could read it in yourself. It's a very short letter. I encourage you all to read this and really pray on and see how the Lord will minister to you. He goes on to say, he says, not to mention that you owe me your life. So he's like, charge it to my account, but don't forget, you owe me one. Not just one. You owe me two. You owe me three. You owe me four. You owe me five. <laughs> so as you're tallying and anything that he has done that is unpleasing to you, charge it to my account. But why is Paul able to say that to him, charge it to my account, is because he knew that he had some change in his pocket. He knew that he had some relational equity with this man. He knew that he had the means of being able to challenge him. He knew that he had a leg to stand on because of the relationship that he had established with him. The way to overcome racism in our country, the way to overcome biases and prejudices is that we got to build relationships. We got to build relationships. And I will tell you this, and I say this with all respect, there are those who want to protest, there are those who want to go into the streets, and I don't necessarily disapprove, but I will tell you this, one thing that we can see from recent history, from American history, if you look at the civil rights movement in the 1960s, people getting together can change laws, no question. People getting together can change laws, but laws will never change the heart of man. Laws will never change the heart of man, and that is the story of the gospel because they had the law, and no change in man's heart ever came until the person of Jesus Christ walked this earth. Until Jesus Christ showed up, our hearts were still hard towards God even though they had the law. Laws will never change the heart of man. So sure, people could get up in arms and people could get upset and have a righteous indignation and rightfully so when we see atrocities, when we see outward blatant racism, when we see police brutality, when we see these things happen. It should anger us. It should put a fire in our belly. But let me tell you, laws will never change the heart of man. And look at our own history. Look at American history. Civil rights acts get passed in the 60s. Is racism gone? No. Why? Because the only thing that will ever get rid of racism, the only thing that will get rid of hatred in the heart of anyone, the only thing that will diffuse the pride in someone's heart is an encounter with Jesus Christ. It's an encounter with Jesus Christ. And when we have that experience and when we have that transformative reality take place of knowing Jesus and we're able to build relationships with people, Say, hey, my Spanish friend, the thing you think about Moroccans, charge that to my account. Because you've opened up your door for me. If you're someone who's Caucasian, you can say, hey, th th those thoughts that you have towards African Americans, charge that to my account. Hey, those things you think about the Chinese, charge that to my account. 
Those things you think about Indians, charge that to my account. The things that you think about my, my wonderful, beautiful friends from Ghana, charge that to my account. Those things that you can think about Filipinos, about Trinidadians, whatever the case is, charge that to my account. All oh, those mixed breeds, those half Puerto Ricans, half Cubans, charge that to my account. <laughs> charge that to my account. Don't forget the Italians, charge that to my account too. When we build the relationship with people, receive him as you would receive me and charge that to my account. The way that we give the answer to a very messy conversation, to one that is layered with realities and experiences and wounds and hurts and things of the like, the way that we give the response as a church is by building relationships. Building relationships with people who don't look like you. Building relationships with people who don't talk like you. Building relationships with people who don't think the way that you think. Because if you stay in your little bubble, and I only associate with my kind, I only associate with people who eat the same food as I do. First of all, you're depriving your palate. Why would you ever do that? <laughs> but if that is your thinking, then you miss the opportunity to enjoy the fullness of God's creation. Because God did not just make Puerto Ricans, although I love the fact that I'm Puerto Rican. God didn't just make Cubans. He didn't just make Central Americans. He didn't just make people from the Caribbean. He didn't just make Latin America. When you have the opportunity to enjoy and experience someone else's culture and see the beauty of our creator God and who they are, and you find it within yourself to go beyond what it is that you think and realize there's beauty here because God is here, because God made them. You find the means of having a love in your heart for people that you never thought you would. A love in your heart for people that you never thought you could. But the story here of Philemon, the challenge to Philemon, the story of Onesimus is one of forgiveness and reconciliation. And is that not the story of the gospel? Because did not Jesus essentially in his actions echo these words? He looked at God in heaven and he said, all of their sin, charge it to my account. Charge it to my account. And is that not the beauty of the gospel that when we come to heaven, Jesus interceding for us, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, when we come to heaven, he says to his father, receive them as you would receive me. Because are we not now co-heirs because of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross? So when we step before our creator, all that we have done, any wrong, any offense, Jesus said, I paid for it on Calvary's cross, charge it to my account. And when we accept that, when we receive that, we come before our God in heaven. He looks at us through the righteousness of his beautiful son, Jesus Christ, and he says, receive them as you would me. How can we emulate this and practice this in our relationships with others? When we have those friends, I don't associate with those people. They talk too much. They do this. They do that. When have you sat down to build a relationship? When have you sat down to have a conversation? I remember growing up, my father only has one volume. Loud. It just is. I mean, he, he's just so loud. <laughs> and I remember growing up, you know, my mother, you know, used to argue, why are you always yelling? Because I'm Cuban. <laughs> it was his answer. And I tell you, I ended up living in Cuba, and I found some soft-spoken Cubans, and it was light bulb went off. I was like, this man, all these years, his audio deficiency, his volume of his voice, he's blaming his people for it. It got nothing to do with it. You're just loud. You're just loud. But all along, my whole life, it's because I'm Cuban and I'm loud. Coming to find out, there are some soft-spoken, quiet Cubans. But my whole life, I thought Cubans were loud. And don't get me wrong, we could get loud. We could get loud. Especially if a baseball game's going or a game of dominoes is happening, whatever the case, we could get loud. There's a reality of we can have these preconceived notions about a people and think, well, they're all like that. 
all Cubans are loud. And then you get to know one, and it's like, you're actually kind of quiet. You're actually kind of introverted. You're actually kind of soft-spoken. And then you realize they're not all the same. Why? Because we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. We are all unique. We may have things in common because of where we come from, but I love when I sit down with Brother Seth and Sister Elizabeth and, and we get talking. And even though I've never been to Ghana, they have actually visited Cuba. The similarities in two countries that couldn't be further away from one another. And when you get to exchange and hear stories and realize we have more in common than we think when we appreciate the beauty in our differences because there are some differences, but when you're able to stop, that's when we're able to have that communal harmony. That is when we are able to love one another as Christ has loved us. That is when we are able to be the representatives and ambassadors of Jesus Christ. If he owes you anything, charge that to my account. If you consider me a partner in this gospel, if you consider me a partner in the work that we have done together, if you consider me a friend, if you consider me a colleague, if you consider me somebody who's worthy of respect, it's up to me to stand in the gap for those who society may deem undesirable. It's up to me to be a voice for those who have been left voiceless by circumstances and situations. It's up to me to say, hey, if you consider me a partner, any esteem and any value that you have for me, receive that as you would me. And if they've done you any wrong, if they've committed any offense, if they've hurt you in any way, charge that to my account. It's what Christ did for you. It's what Christ did for me. And because of what Christ did, Paul said, I can emulate this. I don't need to die on the cross because he died once and for all. But I can say, my dear brother Philemon, Onesimus was your property. No longer view him as property. Receive him now as a brother. Receive him as you would me. And if he wronged you in any way, Charge that to my account. But when you do, don't forget that you owe me your life. Don't forget what I've done for you. I believe Jesus is tugging on our heartstrings today about whatever biases you may have, whatever preconceived notions, even those that are rooted in truth. You may have justifiable reasons for disliking a people group because of experiences that you have had. I'm not minimizing your pain or your suffering, but what I am saying is Jesus is saying to you today, I created them same as I created you. I died for them same as I died for them. Receive them as you would receive me. And any wrong that they have done, charge that to my account. Charge that to my account. So regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of your native tongue, regardless of where you're from, the charge for us today is to let go of whatever burden you may have and leave it at the feet of Jesus. It is to forgive. And it is to be forgiving. It is to be willing to stand in the gap the way Jesus did for us and say, charge it to my account. Receive them as you would. Would you bow your heads this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for your mercy, my Lord. We thank you, Father God, for how you took our place on Calvary's cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the story of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul, it's our story. It's our story. No, we were not slaves, but we are your creation. And like Onesimus who ran away, we ran away from God. And as Paul approached Philemon and said, receive him as you would receive me. Paul, you invite us to return back to our creator. And you say to God the Father, you intercede. Receive him as you would me. Charge it to my account. It is the gospel message of forgiveness and reconciliation. But it is the charge to us to 
be the response and the answer to biases, to prejudices, to hatred, to bigotry, to racism. It is for us to be the voice for the voiceless. It is for us to stand up for those who can't stand for themselves. It is for us to build the relationships. They say, whatever it is you got against them, receive them as you would receive me. Whatever wrong they have done you in any way, charge it to my account. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us to be the response. Help us to be the difference makers. Your word says, Jesus, you said, blessed are the peacemakers. God, can we be peacemakers during a time of such division, hatred, and division? Can we be peacemakers? Can we be those who walk out the gospel story and how we engage with others? Lord, can we do it with confidence that you receive us, God, as you receive your son, Jesus, because we're co-heirs because of what he did. Can all of our sin, all of our shortcomings, all of our wrongdoings have been charged to his account? Can we say the same for our friends, for our families, our loved ones, those who are maybe viewed lower in society, those who are disparaged, discriminated against? And God, and for those of us who have had to deal with discrimination, God, would you put forgiveness in our hearts? Would you help us to forgive? And help us to be the example of forgiveness to others. Because you have forgiven us. Help us to give that which we have received. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. So we'll give the Lord a hand, hand offering this morning. I encourage you all. It's maybe 23 verses, if I'm not mistaken. I might have missed one or two in that number. But read the letter of Philemon. And let the Holy Spirit minister you, challenge you, and encourage you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday and a great week.